Well, good evening, everyone, and we warmly welcome you in the Saviour's name to Cumber Free Presbyterian Church for our Gospel Hour. We're delighted to see you both upstairs and down. Lovely to see so many gathered in on a Sunday evening, and we trust the Lord will richly bless you, encourage your heart, whether you're a regular attender or a visitor to the house. We warmly welcome you in our Saviour's name. And tonight we are having a special testimony evening. We do have some of our folks taking part right through to the end of the year. And it's a wonderful thing to be saved. Now, not every person can stand in the pulpit and give their testimony. We understand that. Uh, some people, I'm not sure if there'll be too many jumping at the opportunity. But we have had uh, individuals who uh, were very, very willing, starting off with their sister Adele and many others, and we're thankful to the Lord they're willing to do this. Our brother Richard Allen was to be here tonight. Richard hasn't been too well and has had a chest infection. We've just switched it around, and our brother James, who was to testify next Sunday evening, God willing, uh, will be testifying tonight. So if you've come to hear Richard and you say, that fellow's fairly changed. I haven't seen him in years. And uh, he's far younger looking. <laughs> well, it's our brother James Watson tonight. And then Richard, God willing, will come uh, next Sunday evening. We also welcome those that are listening on the World Wide Web, whether it's YouTube or Facebook or Sermon Audio and whatever platform you have chosen. We want to uh, warmly welcome you. And we know that last Lord's Day there was a, a very large uh, audience online watching. And we just thank you for that. We pray the Lord will bless you and your family at this time. We're going to worship together by singing a great gospel hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less Than Jesus' Blood and Righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. 313 in our hymn book. <clears throat> Sometimes we sing these hymns so quickly, we close the hymn book or we switch off the projector and uh, we forget about the words that uh, last verse does remind us of the trumpet uh, that will sound for the second coming of Christ. And I wonder today, child of God, speaking to my own heart as well, uh, did you think about his return? Did you think that this might be the day, this might be the night when Christ comes back again, when the Spirit of God will 
uh, command the angel to sound the trumpet and the trumpet will sound and Christ will return to this earth again. It will be the climax of all history, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's coming back again and we're living in what is known as the last of the last days. Do you know what that means? The last days began at Calvary. That's when the last days and the last age of humanity began. And we are in what is known as the last of those last days. And the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. And the hymn writer penned those words, that final verse, when he shall come with trumpet sound, O oh, may I then in him be found, clothed in his righteousness divine, faultless to stand before the throne. I wonder tonight, where do you stand with God? We have convened these testimony evenings that you might see the real thing. And you can't deny the real thing. The counterfeit is out there. The false professor. The one who professes and the one who never goes on with God or does anything for the Lord in their lifetime. They have a little profession whenever they were at Sunday school and that's it. After that, there's nothing. They've got their ticket for heaven and they just live for the world and the devil. Well, that's not salvation. But when he returns again, we need to be found in him, trusting in him, resting in him, and be sure that it's well with our soul. Young person, older person, where do you stand with the Lord tonight? Is it well with your soul? He is coming back. You know, James may not even get to this pulpit tonight. I'm not saying anything's going to happen to him, by the way. <laughs> Definitely not. But what if the Lord returned? You know, we have to write all our meetings in pencil. Because the Lord comes along and he just rubs it all out. And he rewrites it all indelibly with the eternal pen and ink. And the Lord could interrupt this service tonight. He could interrupt this service tonight. I remember being in a meeting one time and an evangelist was preaching. And as he was preaching, he, he was preaching on the second coming of Christ. I told you this illustration before. I'll never forget it because my heart skipped a beat. And I remember him coming as he finished the service. He appealed in the light of the coming of Christ to get right with God, to be ready. And then he spoke about those who will wait, those who will halt between two opinions, those who will look for another opportunity and say maybe tomorrow night or next week. And then he began to sing that great hymn, when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, time shall be no more. And then he got to the second verse, and I'll never forget it. I was sitting in that meeting, and he banged that pulpit as loud as he could. Sorry for scaring you there, Chloe. I scared Chloe there. Sorry about that. But he banged the pulpit. That's not Chloe, is it? It is Chloe, isn't it? It is. Annabeth, sorry. And he banged, the, he banged the pulpit, and I tell you what, whoever was sleeping in that meeting, they woke up. And so did I, and he shouted the words as loud as he could, Stop! 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 And my heart was going, I wondered what on earth has gone on? What has somebody done? I'll never forget because I looked over at the organist and her eyes were as if a rabbit caught in the headlights of a car. And I thought, what is he doing? And he leaned over, I'll never forget, and his voice was shaking. And he was trembling in the pulpit and every single eye was on him. And he says, now listen to me. And I'll tell you who he was, Noel Shields. And he says, you can be thankful that it was Noel Shields who stopped this meeting. What if that had been the second coming of Christ? Where would you have been then? You had maybe intended to speak to Noel Shields after the meeting, but you didn't get the opportunity. The Lord has come, and you're lost. You're finished, it's over, you're damned and doomed. You see, friends, this meeting is not just a social hour. It's not just to have a few people gathered. It takes on a greater significance tonight. We're here to do business between your soul and God. And tonight you need to come to Christ. Repent and believe the gospel. And be sure you're saved for the Lord is coming back again. For those of us who are saved, we want to be walking in the fear of the Lord. And we want to be pleasing him at his coming. Father in heaven, we thank thee for great hymns in our hymn book. We thank thee, Lord, when he shall come with trumpet sound. O oh, may I then in him be found, clothed in his righteousness 
alone, faultless to stand before his throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. And Lord, we know that one of old, one evangelist who was heckled there in Hyde Park in London, whenever he was, Lord, even, Lord, heckled by, Lord, individuals who hate the Lord, when he was preaching on Christ, the solid rock, Lord, we realize that they mocked him and shouted, what about the shamrock? And then he, Lord, gave that great reply. Any rock that's not Christ is a shamrock. And Lord, we believe that. It's only a sham. Lord, it's not the real thing. They talk about the sham fight at Scarva. It's not the real fight. Just a little reenactment. Just uh, playing around. But Lord, we recognize that any other rock people are building on, good works, church attendance, Bible reading, doing the best they can, living a, a good life, Lord, trying to keep the commandments, Lord, just trying to reform and give up this vice and that sin and just moving their lives forward. We realize it's not enough. That's the sham rock. Lord, we realize there's only one true rock, Christ, and on Christ the solid rock, the rock, O oh God, of his finished work and precious shed blood, the rock of his atoning sacrifice. Lord, we want to be standing on that rock when the storm of divine judgment comes to this earth, when God sends the earthquake of divine wrath, when God shakes this earth, only those who are, Lord, upon the rock. The Lord, as the parable says, the one that builds on the sand, it falls to the ground. But we ask, O oh God, you'll help us to build our lives on the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to build for eternity. We pray for lost souls gathered in this house, for individuals who are out of Christ without a saviour. Lord, we're not here to make them free Presbyterians. They wouldn't cross the street to do that. We're here, O oh God, to lead them to Christ, to point them to the only saviour, the only one that can do helpless sinners good, the blessed, lovely Lord Jesus Christ, the one who came, God bless forevermore, the creator of this earth, the one who called this earth into being by the word of his power. Power, the one who is the second person of the triune Jehovah God of Israel, the creator of the ends of the earth, the Elohim of Genesis and the Jehovah of Exodus and the El Shaddai of Abraham, the one who is the Jehovah of the Old Testament and the Jesus of the New. We thank thee that he is God blessed forevermore and yet he entered into our humanity by the miracle of the virgin birth and we bless thee, O God, the virgin and gave forth her son and brought brought her firstborn into this world. And we thank thee, O God, that it was that holy child, thine only begotten and well-beloved son, God veiled in human flesh. We thank thee that he lived as a man and dwelt amongst men, and he lived that sinlessly perfect life that we could not live. And then we, we believe on him and receive him as our saviour. His righteousness is given over to our account, and we stand before thee not in our own righteousness or rightness, but in the righteousness of thy son, accepted in the well-beloved and we thank thee that he has done it all he has finished the work and we praise thee he gave himself into the hands of cruel and wicked men and there on the cross of Calvary, he suffered, bled, and died, and substituted himself for us. He took my place, and he died for me. Lord, we realize that Calvary was personal. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and Paul says, of whom I am chief. And we ask, O oh God, that you will bring that conviction tonight, convict individuals of their sin. And, O oh God, do we pray that like the Apostle Paul, the Spirit of God will, re God will reason with them concerning O oh God, righteousness, the need to be right with God concerning temperance, the need for self-control with sin and lusts and appetites. We realize, O oh God, the a reason of judgment to come. And Lord, there is a judgment day. And we know that, Lord, for saint and sinner alike, there is a judgment day. And Lord, for those who us, of us who are saved, we'll never be judged for our sins, for they were judged on Christ at Calvary. And he finished the work. He paid the price. He rose from the dead. He's alive forevermore. A dead man can do us no good, but Christ is alive. At thy right hand exalted, he lives within our hearts by faith. And we rejoice that many in this meeting house and online know him as their own and personal saviour. There was that definitive moment in their experience at that time whenever they were born again, when they were saved by sovereign grace, when they became 
a Christian because we're not born Christians. And we thank thee, O God, for saving grace and keeping power. And we rejoice in it. And we thank thee, our Father and God, for our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. And we know uh, for us we'll stand before thee and we will give an account for our service or even the lack of it. Our works will be tried by fire. Wood, hen, stubble, burnt up, silver, gold, and precious stones will remain. And we pray, O God, that we will have jewels to set in the crown of our blessed Saviour, and we will present every crown to him who loved me and gave himself for me. And we think of the unconverted. If they die without Christ, if they die in their sin where Jesus is, they'll never be. And our hearts go out to them. We never would could point a finger, for there go I but for the grace of God. And we're all hell-deserving, ill-deserving and undeserving sinners. We recognize it, O oh God. There's no one on a higher moral ground than any other in this house, not even this preacher in the pulpit. Realize, O oh God, there's level ground at the cross. And we're sinners. And there's no one better than another. There's no one high and mighty. Lord, we realize, O oh God, in thy sight, we are unrighteous. We are unjust. We are sinners of deep dye. And we acknowledge it. And there is a judgment day. You think of the great white throne judgment. When those who were classed as the wicked dead. That Lord they will stand before the great white throne judgment. And they will be judged according to their works. And then death and hell will be cast into the lake of fire. And Lord there they remain for all eternity. We pray O oh God for mercy. We pray for great grace. We pray Lord you will... Remember this meeting tonight, it takes on a greater significance when we think of hell, when we think of heaven, we think of how a sinner needs to be saved, and the good news, the glad tidings, the blessed hope of the gospel, that if they come as sinners to Christ and believe that he died for them at Calvary, and then repent of their sin and confess their sin and be sincere about it, Lord, you will forgive their sin. You will cleanse them through the merit of the blood and you will pardon and you will save and you'll give them peace with God and eternal life. You'll assure them of a home in heaven and even in time you'll prepare them and you'll keep them and you'll watch over them and you'll care for them. And we just pray you'll do that and you'll answer prayer tonight. And in this house, Lord, you'll bless thy servant, our brother James. We thank thee for him. We thank thee for his labor of love over many, many years in this house for his service for thee elsewhere. We thank thee, O God, he's been a faithful witness for Christ in these days. We bless thee he has used opportunities to reach out to his fellow man with the gospel. We thank thee for the work he does in this house. We thank thee for his faithfulness in the meetings. We thank thee above all, Father, for saving him, for watching over him, being with him and keeping him. And as he comes to share with us something of what the Lord means to him and has done for his soul. We pray he'll make much of the Saviour. He'll exalt Christ tonight. And thou would bless him and his family in their own hearts tonight. And we pray, Lord, you remember all our families. That some of us have loved ones out of Christ without a Saviour. And Lord, our hearts go out to them, but they go up to thee. And just as you said to that father about his son, bring him to me. And we bring our loved ones to thee. Some are in a terrible state tonight. Lord, some are out in the mountains, wild and bare. Some are like the prodigal in the far country, with little or no thought for their soul. They're lost, and they need to be saved. And Lord, those of us who know the truth and have been saved by thy grace, and we know what it is to have our sins forgiven and peace with God and the assurance of heaven and to know the reality of hell. We pray for them. And we humbly reach out and love in our souls as best as humanly we can. And we pray for the little lambs of this flock that each might come to know Christ as their Savior. We pray for our young people. We love them dearly in the Lord. And we pray, Lord, you will save our young people and those that are saved. We pray, Lord, you will sanctify them and set them apart for holy use and bless them and do them good. So hear our prayers tonight and answer our humble cry 
And Father, in answer now to prayer, be pleased to save the lost, restore the backslidden, revive thy church, glorify thy Son, and the people of God said, Amen. Let's just turn in our Bibles for a brief Bible reading before our clerk of session, Mr. Jackie Alistair, comes to bring the announcements. It's 1 Timothy and the chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Just read a few verses together from verse 5. 1 Timothy, the chapter 1 and verse 5, let us all read and hear the word of the Lord. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity or love out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before, this is Paul's testimony, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Amen. We'll end our reading at verse 15. We know the Lord will indeed bless the public reading of his own precious and infallible word. We're going to ask our clerk of session, Mr. Jackie Allister, if he'll come forward. He's going to make some necessary announcements. Thank you. Well, again, this evening, it is good to be able to welcome so many uh, out to the house of God. Uh, we're glad to see each one, every one of you, and we do pray that you will all enjoy the presence of the Lord uh, in our meeting tonight. Do remember uh, the meetings during the week, uh, Tuesday evening at 7 p.m., uh, there is the mustard seed meeting, there is a special speaker on Tuesday evening, uh, our sister Christina Logan will be along to address the boys and girls on Tuesday evening, and then that's followed at 8 p.m., by the men's, uh, by the prayer meeting and time of Bible study. Uh, Friday at 8 p.m., the Youth Fellowship, and then at 10 p.m., we come to the men's prayer meeting as usual, so keep that in mind. Next Lord's Day, the service is at the usual times, quarter past 10, the Sunday school and Bible class, half past 11 and 7 p.m., the two meetings. Reverend, Murray, uh, Reverend Martin will be with us, uh, and as he mentioned, uh, there will be that testimony uh, at the evening service when our brother, Mr. Richard Allen, God willing, uh, will be able to be along with us uh, next Lord's Day evening. Do, of course, remember as well that there are the half hour of prayer uh, before each of the services next Lord's Day up in the upper room over in the church hall uh, before the service. Uh, just a few other things we mentioned this morning. We'll remind you again. If you have uh, a missionary box for the support of our brother, Robert McConnell, uh, then uh, I would ask that you bring that, those boxes in over the next couple of weeks, please. Uh, a few things on the table in the porch as you leave. The Let the Bible Speak calendars are there. Uh, they're priced at £3.50. And if you're taking one, just put your name on the list there uh, in the hall, and you can see me at a later stage. The Let the Bible Speak Quarterly magazine is also there. That's a free publication, uh, so take a copy of that with you 
as well. And then there's the two books there that have been mentioned last Lord's Day and today. Uh, there's the one uh, compiled by the Reverend Stanley Barnes. It's a book of daily readings, uh, and it's based on notes uh, from the, uh, Dr. Alan Kearns, uh, and that uh, book is there. Again, there's a, a list if you want to uh, put your name down and take one, uh, and also another book uh, on the life of the Reverend Hugh Hanna, uh, pre uh, authored by uh, Mr. David Brown from our Bangor congregation, and that too there is available uh, if you want to take a copy. Thank you. I do thank our brother Jackie very much indeed for making those announcements, subject as always to the divine will of the Lord. Uh, God willing, next Lord's Day afternoon, weather permitting, uh, we will be starting some outreach with the calendars. We do have 3,500 of them ordered, printed, and ready to go. Alongside that, we do have a card done up for our youth work, our children's work, and our Sunday school. And of course, we do need uh, some help from yourselves. We have taxed you all year, I know, Sunday afternoon after Sunday afternoon, the mission, the week of prayer, and the openers, and other outreach as well, ventures, and you have really exceeded, and we know that you've uh, really had a good performance in outreach, and we just need this final push. And as I said before, it's not how we start, it's how we finish. We want to finish the year well, and these gospel calendars, they're, they're little children's calendars, and they're very popular. And uh, remember, if someone takes one, and most do, uh, in the area here, it's a little missionary in the home. It's a little gospel preacher, 365 days of the year. That gospel text is like a missionary in their kitchen, in their living room, in their bedroom. And it's a very colourful calendar and, a, and some wonderful gospel texts. And uh, we know that people not only take them, but uh, generally when you're doing outreach, they run after you and they give you the literature back and chase you and tell you never to come back. But with the calendars, they say, could I have a few more? And they like them for their children and their grandchildren. And it's always a joy to hand these out at the end of the year. Now, we have 3,500 and we need your help in the next Sunday afternoons, if the weather permits us to do that, to give out these calendars and these cards. It'll be the last venture of outreach and evangelism uh, that we do, God willing, 2021, and then we will recommence in the new year with some new ventures as the Lord leads us. 322, just before our brother James comes to share his testimony, we'll sing this hymn together. I heard the, the Saviour say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Let's all stand as we sing. Thank you. 
the Lord. You may be seated. Well, as we've already intimated in the beginning of the service, we do have our good friend and brother in Christ, uh, brother Mr. James Gibson. No, sorry, James Watson. I think of a young fella I know, a young fella I know, James Watson. Uh, I've known James for quite a while, even before I came to the church here, and uh, certainly had rich fellowship with him in many meetings and personal conversations. And we trust the Lord will bless him tonight as he comes with us. We're going to invite our brother James now to come and share with us a personal word of testimony. Thank you. I was hoping uh, Mr. Martin was going to sing Psalm 119 there. <laughs> but anyway, um, sorry, just getting ready here. Um, before we start, we'll just open in a wee word of prayer. Father in heaven, as we come again before thee, we just acknowledge, Lord, my weakness even before thee now. I just ask, Lord, for help even given tonight. Lord, it won't be words from me, but it'll be words from thee. And we do pray, Lord, for even one Lord that's listening in online even tonight, even one Lord that's in this meeting tonight, Lord, that will put their saving trust in thee and even realize, Lord, that they're only a breath away from being ushered out into God's eternity. And Father, Lord, we just come before thee even now. Lord, just help me, I ask of thee. Lord, I need thee in this meeting even now. Just help me, I pray thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, before I start, I just want to uh, bring to you or read a couple of verses from Second uh, Chronicles chapter 33. And basically, this is my testimony summed up in a couple of verses. So 2 Chronicles chapter 33, verses 10 to 13. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. Therefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. And prayed unto him, and he was entreated of him, and heard his supplication, and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. I'll just start by introducing myself. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm uh, James Watson, and I was born and bred here in the town of Cumber. Uh, I was born into a family um, of three, and uh, it was the middle one. Um, my parents were saved, they're Christians, and they're in the Bel they were in the Belfast City Mission. So from no age at all, the Word of God was taught to us. Uh, right and wrong was taught. We knew the meaning of it, whether or not I abided by it or not. It's another thing. But um, So from no age at all, like we were sent along to different meetings in the churches. Um, on like a Tuesday night, we were sent here to the children's meeting over in what was the old wee wooden hut just across where the new building is. Um, Wednesday, we were at the children's meeting in Newton Arch Congregational, and Thursday, we were at the children's meeting in Cumber Baptist. Sunday, we were twice on a Sunday in the uh, uh, service, and then Sunday school as well. So, like, we had a fair bit of scripture and um, services packed into a week, like we knew right from wrong. And... Uh, that was grand, you know. Even though I was born into a Christian home, I still was born a sinner. 
And even though mum and dad were saved, it didn't make me saved. Like, you know, it came to a point in my time in my life when I realised that I had to get right with God. But, you know, there was one day in Sunday school and we were up in the Jersey Street uh, City Mission. My dad was a missionary up there at the time. And it was one day, one Sunday, my dad was actually covering the class for Sunday school, or my class even. And I don't know what age I was, maybe five, six, something like that, I don't know. But uh, dad spoke that day about heaven and hell. And he spoke about the pleasantness and how great heaven will be. But he also turned it around and he spoke of the horrors of what hell will bring. And you know, as a wee kid of five or six or whatever age I was, that absolutely put the fear into me. If I was to die that day, I'd be separated from mum and dad, but for all eternity as well. And you know, dad just asked his class that day, did anyone want to get saved? And there in the wee missionary's room in Jersey Street, on the Shankill Road, I gave my life to the Lord. But you know, going through primary school, it's easy, you just take your stand and that's it like, but it's whenever you get to high school is sort of when I say your faith gets tested more. And to my shame, I went to high school and probably the first year I, was, I took my stand. But after that, I sort of became a Sunday Christian, basically. Um, I went to church on a Sunday, but like my Bible was not open during the week. Um, I was probably doing, I was saying stuff, doing things that I shouldn't have been doing, like, and just fitting in with the rest of the, uh, the lads in school. Like, but <clears throat> during this time, like, in school days, all that was on my mind was football. I literally lived and breathed football. And sort of finished school, and that was dead on. Still was playing football basically every night of my life. And uh, that was grand. Like, it was just, that was my life, was football. Woke up, played football, uh, you know, at nights. And I was going to the park. I was going to the leisure center. Anywhere there was a football being kicked, I was in the midst of it. And um, basically, just that was it. I finished school and um, I started doing a sports course. And I thought, brilliant, we'll play football. We'll... But no, they'll give you essays after essays after essays. And I just thought, no, that's not for me. Um, so basically, they gave me the ultimate of 14 assignments to do in one week or goodbye, and I says, right, goodbye. <laughs> I wasn't doing 14 assignments. But then they says, well, what do you want to do? And I says, don't know, I'll maybe go and do an apprenticeship in joinery or something. So I signed up and I done an apprenticeship in joinery, but at this time, like I was literally playing football week in, week, or not even week in, it was every night I was down. Uh, I was going to Lisbon to play, I was going to Newton Ards. Everywhere I could see there was a football match, I was at it. like. And I just literally lived and breathed for football. But you know, I remember every Tuesday night, my dad would always stand at the top of the stairs and he would say, James, are you not going to the prayer meeting tonight? And my response was always this, no dad, I have to go and play football. But you know, friend, I didn't have to play. I was choosing to play it. That was the God of my life at that time. And I didn't see that. And I know fine rightly now, looking back, that broke mum and dad's heart that I did not go to the prayer meetings. But I was content, friend, to go and play football. And as I said, that was the God of my life. And just like here we have in the Bible verses that are read, you know, it says there in Second Chronicles chapter 33 and verse 10, And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. And friend, that was me. Every Tuesday night, the Lord was speaking to me through my dad, saying, Are you not going to the prayer meeting? But, you know, I hearkened my heart. I went and played football and I enjoyed my life. Like, I just, any, as I said, anywhere football was kicked, I was happy. Like, but, you know, it came to a point a week before my 21st birthday. Again, I was playing football. Uh, we were right up in Lurgan this time. We were up playing just for a wee five-side mess about. And I wrecked my knee ligaments. And that was me on crutches for a while. <laughs> and uh, it broke me, this. It absolutely broke me. But you know, friend, for ages, and as I lay awake at nights with the pain in my leg and my knee, I started Googling what this knee injury was all about. 
And boys were saying on different forums and stuff like that that um, they never recovered from it, from this knee injury. And you know, that was just, that was disastrous for me. Like I thought, how am I ever going to never play football again? Like, and for basically six months, the Lord had to bring me into affliction at this point. Just the way he brought Manasseh through the thorns, like I had to go through six months of not kicking a football. And you may say, well, what's the big deal of that? But you know, friends, I lived and breathed football. And for six months, not even kicking a ball, this was just unheard of. Like, but you know, sort of lay at nights and I just wasn't happy in my life. Like I just thought, as Mr. Martin was saying this morning, that when our trials and tribulations hit our lives, how often do we look away from the Lord? How often do we just um, turn our eyes to something else and um, <clears throat> we curse God and we say, like, why God? Why have you brought this on us? And, you know, I lay at nights and I was doing the exact same as this. I was just literally going, like, why, Lord? Why, Lord, did you bring this upon me? Why, Lord, did you bring this injury to me? Like, why not someone else? And I just got to the stage, like, I thought, well, if I never play football again, what's the point in living? Like, I says, I might as well just end it. And I sort of started thinking of different ways I could maybe end my life, like, because... You see, I literally, that was what my life was. Um, I had big plans when I was playing football because uh, I was playing in age group a couple of years above me and I wasn't afraid of going in for tackles or anything like that. Like, I feared no one on the football field. <laughs> and um, I had visions of, or plans that you'd maybe play Irish League of some sort. Uh, I know the standard was a lot lower back then. <laughs> like, um, but you know, this was all was on my mind. Like it was just football, football, football. And as I said, I was lying awake at nights and just could not think of anything else apart from just, well, that's it. I might as well end my life because football's gone from me. Like I'll never kick a ball again. But you know, I got an insurance payout for my knee. And I says, right, I'm going to Scotland. I had enough of home. I had enough of... Just to think because I thought and I was blaming God for this injury. And I just said, you know what, I'm going and I'm not coming back. I'm not looking near a church. I'm not doing this and that. And, you know, I had big plans to go to Scotland and that was fair enough. Like, and um, I sort of thought, right, well, I, once I get sort of half fit again and be able to walk, I'm away. So I got my pay out of my insurance thing and off I went uh, or booked my boat over to Scotland and I remember dad saying to me one day he says well have you anywhere to stay and I says no not yet but I'll worry about that sometime and he says well would you stay in the faith mission bible college in Edinburgh if I got you and I says aye well that'll do all right I thought well it's cheap accommodation and it'll do me rightly like but you know um the day came I backed my bags and I was heading off to Scotland and, you know, I had no intention of church life. I had no intention of anything. You know, to me, I had plans and visions of this young Ulster boy going over to Scotland and meeting a few um, Scottish girls and birds. Like, But um, it's funny how <laughs> what goes through your head, like, at a young age. <laughs> um, so the day he went or came and I was about to head off and Dad just said to me, he says, Oh, here's your Bible. You must have forgot the packet. I went, ah, yeah, yeah, I must have forgot to, but I deliberately forgot or deliberately had left it out because I had no intention of reading it or anything. Like, so put it in the case and away I went. Right in Scotland and that was dead on. Um, I was, before this, I was talking to a couple of boys that I knew was over there and they said, oh, there's plenty of work for you and all this here. So I thought, right, dead on. But as I went to Scotland, a few days sort of passed and was back and forward to the job centres and uh, you were promised all these interviews, blah, 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 and nothing ever told off it. Like, there was one day I was just sitting bored, or just sitting in my room, bored out of my head, and I thought, what do I do? Like, and I just literally lifted my Bible that I'd packed, and I just opened it, and I'd, I read it, or opened it to Ecclesiastes 3, and it was just, I read the first, uh, f- first eight verses, and basically this passage just tells of times and seasons, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to heal, a time to 
um, cast away. And um, I encourage you later just to read this portion. Like, and I sort of sat there in that wee room in the Faith Mission in um, Edinburgh, and I just read that passage over and over again. And I realized, I thought, you know, it's time I was coming back to the Lord. I knew my life wasn't right. I knew I wasn't happy. And it just was, the Lord was speaking to me through this passage. And just there in Edinburgh, I just bowed the knee and sort of said, right, Lord, I'm sorry for going astray. Please, Lord, just come into my heart again. And I know that at that point, the Lord entered into my life. And that was all right. I sort of uh, still hadn't any work at this stage in Edinburgh. And I thought, right, well, I'll just come on home. And I just came on home. But I do believe God had to take me to Edinburgh to get me to even think about these things again. Like, because if I stayed at home, I wouldn't have looked near the Bible again. I wasn't happy in my life back home. And it was just, you know, go to church, go to this. But I wasn't happy. Like, and um, I do believe like God had to take me into affliction. And he had to take me to Edinburgh to get my attention. And I just asked Stephen tonight, what does God have to do to get your attention, young person, older person, unsaved person here tonight, those that will listen in online? Like, what does God have to do to get your attention? You know, friend, when God wants your attention, just beware, there's going to be tears, there's going to be turmoil, and your life's going to be upside down if God wants your attention. You know, friend, I sat, as I said, and I want the day in my life because the God in my life was football. But, you know, friend, God had to break that God in my life to get my attention. And maybe tonight, friend, I'm asking a question, what does God have to do to get your attention? You know, friend, do you have to be cut out of a car crash this week? Do you have to even be told by a doctor that you have seriously ill or a seriously ill illness that or do you have to have a relationship that breaks down? Or I don't know, friend, but what does God have to do to get your attention here tonight? Would it not just be easier to submit to him tonight instead of being dragged through the thorns and into affliction the way I was, the way um, Manasseh was as well? But, you know, that was all right. I came home again, and that was dead on. And 20, or what year was it? 2010, uh, Myself and two other boys had booked to go to Australia. And that was all right. This was a big thing. Like, this was, we were heading to the other end of the world. So we had our ticket for Australia, and away we went, three of us. And during this time in Australia, sort of, there's a few things, um, a few things that sort of happened that really sticks in my mind and things I'll never forget. Like, and um, there's one day, I was just sitting eating my breakfast and I was looking at the, just reading the back of the cereal box, just sort of daydreaming. And the words on the back of the um, cereal box really caught my attention. It just literally said, when the time comes, will you be ready? And it was advertising more uh, athletics. And I thought, right, I was just kept thinking about those words, when the time comes, will you be ready? And I pondered over those words day and day after day after day. When the time comes, will you be ready? You see, the Bible says in Hebrews 9, verse 27, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. You know, in Amos 4 and 12 says, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. And each and every one of us in this church building here tonight, each and every one that's listening in online tonight, is going to meet God at one stage like you know, it doesn't matter if you believe in the Lord or not. There's one day you will meet the Lord. And I remember Mr. Murray spoke a sermon from this pulpit uh, a number of years ago. And he said a wee thing. And he says, you'll either meet the Lord in the clouds or you're going to meet him in the courts. But one day, friend, you're going to meet the Lord. And are you ready to meet him tonight? In what way do you stand before God tonight, people? Um... It's just those words really caught my attention. When the time comes, will you be ready? And friend, are you ready to meet the Lord tonight? And Mr. Martin's even touched on it even before the start of, or the start of the service. What if the Lord was to come tonight, even before I'm finished? Even before you say, oh, I'll get saved once I get finished, once I get home. But friend, you're not even guaranteed to go home. You're not even guaranteed tomorrow. You know, friend, and we're not even guaranteed another five minutes of this service, like... The Bible says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And friend, 
That was one thing that really stuck in my mind in Australia. But there was another few things that um, we sort of joined the local football league over there and we were training and this was all right. But you know, the problem was the matches was on a Sunday and the boys had said to me, they said, oh, we'll get you signed up and you mean you can play. And I says, no, I'll come to training, but I'm not going to play on a Sunday. And to this, for the Australians, it just seemed weird why I would not play on a Sunday. And I just said, look, I'm not doing it. I'm a Christian, end of story. I'm not playing on a Sunday. But, you know, there was a fellow there from the team, and he says, oh, I'm a Christian, but sure, I play. But his definition of Christian and my definition of Christian was two different things. Like, And I just said, no, I says, I'll not be doing it. I says... I'll give an account one day of what I've done in my life and I'll not be playing on a Sunday. So there was another fellow in the team and he turned to me and he says, well, would you play on a Saturday? And I says, yeah, but sure, the matches are on a Sunday. And he says, yes, but that's all right. He says, he was in the committee of the league or something and he said, right, I'll, uh, if we can change the games from a Sunday to a Saturday, would you play? And I went, certainly. And ten... Seven, sorry, of the last ten remaining games of that season was changed from a Sunday to a Saturday so I could play. And, you know, I went on to score three goals in those seven games. And for me, I had never scored a goal in my life before, so this was a, <laughs> this was a big thing. Like, But, you know, friend, I was just reminded in that uh, portion and, um, where the Lord spoke to Samuel, and he says, those that honour me, I will honour. And, you know, friend, even though I was at the other end of the world, even though the boys that I went out with were playing and they were enjoying life, and they were playing football on a Sunday and stuff, but, you know, to me, it could have been very easy just to say, well, you know what I mean, I'm away from home, I'm at the other end of the world, Mr. Murray at that time will never know I played football on a Sunday, the elders of this church won't know I played football on a Sunday, what's the big deal? But, you know, friend, I took my stand for the Lord out there, and the Lord honoured that, and... I just asked, or just saying this to even the young people, even tonight that's gathered in, you know, take your stand for the Lord. It costs more not to, young person. And at the end of the day, I could have played on a Sunday and maybe never scored. <laughs> or I played on a Saturday and honoured the Lord. And, you know, I scored three, which I was happy about. Like, <laughs> But um, that was another thing. It was just sort of how the Lord, you know, honours his people that, honours him. And just another thing that caught me, or it sort of happened in Australia that was uh, meaningful to me, like, and it was one of the fellows that went with me, uh, it was a friend of mine, Aaron, and Aaron was brought up in a Christian home, but Aaron was backsliding, and he was deep into the world when we went to Australia. And you know, it broke my heart seeing Aaron week in, week out, going out to the clubs, the nightclubs, the casinos, etc., etc. Like, But I know, and Aaron would even say to himself, that Aaron was not happy in his life. And sort of, there wasn't a night I didn't shed tears for Aaron. Like, it broke my heart just seeing the way he was getting on. But, you know, there's many a time Aaron, even in his sinful state and the way he was getting on, said to me, he says, I'm not happy. But he says, once I get home, I'll get right with the Lord. And I kept saying, Aaron, you're maybe not even guaranteed to get home. That's the problem. Like, and how would you do if you died in a sinful state, and backslidden state? But, you know, that was all right. I went off traveling part of Australia, and I left the boys that I was with. But there was a song that had come on the radio, and it was just the line of the song that sort of caught my attention. And I think it was from Bonnie M., and it was from the ba rivers of Babylon, where we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. And as I was just sort of heading off traveling, I was on the train, and I was really burdened for Aaron, and I just sort of wrote a letter to him, and the two of us would have always, we heard, we both of us heard this song a number of times on the radio, and we sort of uh, would have sung along and just gaped about and all that like, but those words, particularly that day, just sort of really hit hard home to me, like, and I just thought, I was burdened so much for Aaron that I just wrote this letter to him. But you know, I spoke to, or I wrote this letter and I just said to Aaron, is it not time you were getting right with the Lord again? 
And I said to him, I mentioned those, that line in that song, I says, Aaron, when was the last time you remembered Zion? When was the last time you remembered how happy you were trusting in the Lord? Like, and I said other things in it, like, and I posted the letter and said nothing. Aaron texted me a wee while later, and he says, got that letter the day he sent me, and I went, right. He says, you weren't holding back on that one. And I went, well, I says, the Lord's burden you on my heart. And I says, I'm not going to apologize for it. So Aaron, you sort of, he says he couldn't get the words out of that letter, out of his head at all. Like, and we went our separate ways, went traveling. That was all right. Um, sort of, I came on home then, and Aaron had stayed on um, in Australia for a few more months. And there was one night, when I was home, and I didn't even realize at this stage Aaron had come home. But he said, he rung me one night, and he says, James, you'll never guess what. And I says, what's wrong, Aaron? He says, I got back to the Lord there last night at a mission. And you know, friend, my heart left for joy. For just even seeing Aaron, like, and the change in his life, even over a night. Because I had seen what Aaron was like, and I had seen what, the way he was living. But he'll even say himself, like, he was not living the way he should have been. And that just brought me to sort of, as much as I loved Australia, and it was probably one of the best years of my life out traveling, but just to hear those words from Aaron that he got back and saved, back with the Lord again, and it just sort of thrilled my heart to even think that. Like, And I'm just saying this to people even tonight. There's maybe one person that you're praying for, and you've pleaded with the Lord for them. But, you know, we never give up on them. I could have given up on Aaron when I seen him week in, week out, but I just prayed in joy or in tears, and one day I reaped in uh, joy hearing about Aaron. Like, and I'm just saying, if you're praying for someone, a family member, a friend, or anything like that, that's breaking your heart even tonight, don't give up on them. You know, the Lord will answer your prayers at one stage. Like, um, so that was basically Australia, um, 2015, sort of. Uh, brought a very low point in my life. Uh, at this point, I was due to get married. I was engaged, due to get married, and the whole thing fell apart. And this absolutely broke me. I was in tears, and brokenness couldn't even describe what, it, what how I was feeling. It was just, I was empty. And you know, the devil kept saying to me, and I remember this so much, like the devil kept saying, and he was really, really, there was such a battle going on in my head. And the devil just kept saying, James, your life's over. Just end your life. Your life's over. And he had me convinced that much that there was one night in particular, I said, right, tonight's the night I'm doing it. And even work that week, some of the bosses said to me, they says, James, you're not well looking. And I went, oh, come all right. And they says, no, James, you're not, you're just not yourself. And I says, I could be all right. Like, but, I just sort of knew in my head I was going to end my life that night. And the devil just kept hitting me and hitting me and hitting me. James, your life's over. Your life's over. It's not even worth living anymore. And one night, I can't even remember what night it was, but I made sure mum and dad were away to bed. And I mean, I, said, I waited for maybe half an hour, an hour, until I knew they were fast asleep. And I said this before, not even the Lambeg drums would have woke them up that night. <laughs> they were snoring that loud that I'm surprised the council never found them for breaching the decibel levels. But, you know, I waited until they were sound asleep. And I literally tiptoed out of that house as quiet as it could ever go. And I said to myself, right, that's it. I'm, by the time they wake up in the morning, I'll be long gone. And I sort of... Drove into, or jumped into the wee van at the time and I drove to Ballywalter Harbour. And I stood on the brink of Ballywalter Harbour. And I mean, I couldn't even move another inch before I was into that water. And with tears streaming down my face, I said, that's it. Goodbye to everything. Like, and just on one ear, the, the devil was really hitting me, saying, just do it, James, your life's over. And on the other ear, the Lord was speaking to me. And he says, James... What about your family? And I was torn in pieces standing on the very edge of Valley Walter Harbour that night. And I literally was ready to, I just did not know what to do anymore. 
And the devil has said, just kept hitting me and hitting me and hitting me. If James just do it, your life's over. But the Lord just kept saying, James, what about your family? What about your family? And after maybe I don't know how long it was, standing there being torn in pieces, I jumped back into the van. And why I brought a phone with me, I do not know, because at the end of the day, I had it in my head that I was just going to uh, end my life, and that was it. Like, why I brought my phone, I have no idea. But obviously, in the spare of the moment, I brought my phone. And as I sat in the van, I said, right, I'm going home. And just as I turned the ignition on the key, mum rung me. And she says, where are you at? I says, I'm out of drive. And she says, right, will you be long home? And I says, I'll be about 20 minutes or so. But you know, friend, people may say, oh, that was just chance that mum woke up. But friends, that was, not the, that was not chance at all. That was the providence of God in my life. You know, as I said, what woke mum up was God. What woke mum up to come into my room to check to see where I was? Like, that was God speaking to mum and leading her to uh, ring me. And you know, friend, I only stand here tonight by the grace of God. It's not anything that I have done. But, you know, that night, I had, if I had my way, I was gone that night. Like, but, you know, friend, God has a plan for each and every one of our lives. And that plan for my life was not to end my life that night. Like... I do believe it, that God has a plan, and he has a plan for each and every one of us. And maybe we don't see it at the time, and maybe the Lord takes us through a number of years before he reveals his plan to us. But, you know, it was, I do believe that it was God's providence and God's hand upon my life that night, because I was gone always. Like, but, you know, sort of, um, it just brings me near to the end of my testimony of sort of how God's kept me and saved me. And I just encourage you people and young people, take your stand for the Lord. Like, as I said, these instances happened to me in Australia and um, never give up praying for that loved one that you keep praying for. You know, God will answer prayers, like, and uh, his timing's always right. And the, the hardest part of God's timing is waiting. We we'll often think that Oh, we'll just do it our own way. We'll just go our own way. Um, we'll just do this. We'll just do that. But you know, friend, God's way is always the best way. As far and as hard as we maybe not even see it or as clear as we see it, but you know, friend, God's way is always right. Like, And it doesn't matter, you know, if God tells you to wait 10 years, why only wait nine years and do your own thing? Friend, if God tells you to wait on something, wait on it. Um, but I think that's sort of... That just brings me to the end of my testimony there. Well, we'd just like just to say a personal word of thanks to our brother James for sharing with us a very personal word of testimony. It's not easy to revisit a lot of the things that happen in our lives and uh, some people do not have the life that others have. Some people certainly are uh, shielded. They're kept from the sins of this world. They do get saved as children, as young people, and they go on with God. That's true. And we're glad to see that. And we would wish that to be the case in every person's life. But it's not always the same. Uh, folks have their struggles. They have their temptations. They have their problems. And the Christian life is not a bed of roses. And people feel that perhaps if I get saved, then everything will just turn out well, and I'll prosper in my work, my health and everything, nothing will go wrong, and my marriage will be blessed, and I will increase my salary, and I'll have more joy, but uh, the Christian life was never intended to be a bed of roses. It's not easy uh, to be a Christian. I want to tell you something, and I really do mean this. You need courage, uh, and you need resilience, and determination, and sincerity, and you need bravery to be a Christian, to become a Christian, to live the life of discipline and to follow the Lord and to obey the Lord. Uh, but we're not left to ourselves whenever we're saved. God does take care of us. Now, he leads some through the water, that's for sure. He leads some through the flood, even some through the fire, but all through the blood. God leads his dear children along. He teaches us many lessons in life, 
He had to teach Manasseh. My brother brought that out clearly. He had to teach Manasseh a very important lesson until he knew that he was God. And Manasseh was an evil, wicked individual. You ever read the life of Manasseh? In fact, if we didn't have Second Chronicles 33, we would never put him in heaven, that's for sure. He sacrificed his children in the fire. He burnt them alive and offered them to Molech. He practiced idolatry and paganism. And he rebelled completely and entirely against the Lord. And he put himself under the wrath of God. And God's justice and wrath should have destroyed Manasseh. Should have destroyed him. But God waited to be gracious. And God was merciful and loving and kind. And the Bible says he took Manasseh among the thorns. You know what that means? God put a thorn bush in his way. He was heading over the cliff for eternal destruction. And God stopped him. And James put it well. I think he put it very well. What has God got to do in your life to get your attention? In many ways, he had to bring James to the lowest point in his life to get his attention. The conventional means are there. The preaching of the gospel, an evening like tonight, is what is known as the conventional means of God. The usual means he uses, just to call you through a testimony, through a preacher, through the word of God, just to speak to your heart, show you that you're a sinner, and then reveal Christ who died on the cross, who shed his blood, who rose from the dead, who paid the price for sin, and then by his spirit he calls you. That's the conventional means that he, he uses to bring souls to himself. And many in this house have come through the conventional means. But then the Lord uses drastic measures. Now, whenever one was seeking the attention, I think it was Absalom seeking the attention of Joab. And Joab refused to come when he called. Absalom called again and called again. And Joab still refused. And if you read the account of Scripture, it tells us that Absalom took fire and he burnt the barley fields. And whenever inquiry was made by Joab, who did this? It was said, Absalom, he's looking your attention. And he got it. God had to take me down a road or allow me to go down a road in order that my life in many ways was destroyed and ruined. And like our brother James, I can tell you, now the devil is real and he does whisper those thoughts and he does tell you how worthless and useless you are. He reminds you the only way out is to take your own life when you reach rock bottom. But I'm glad, like our brother James, when we reach rock bottom, we find the rock of ages. We find Christ. And the Lord is merciful tonight. He's waited for years on you. He's been patient because he's a God of love. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to that place of repentance. But he'll not always wait. His spirit will not always strive. And for all we know, we don't know, but tonight could be the final call, the last opportunity for you to get right with God. This could be it, my friend, if you but knew. God's final call. Only heaven knows that. And if the Lord was to reveal his mind now to this preacher and to God's people and to you and say, this is it. In the history of the world, I've written it up. This is the last night. This night is the last night. The 28th, is it, of November 2021. Written down in God's mind in his book of remembrance. That's the last Sunday night that I'm ever going to strive and work and call that individual. And they've wasted too many years, thrown away too many opportunities, and there's no more. And unless you come tonight to Christ, unless you're saved tonight, this could be it, God's final call. I'll finish by saying this. In the life of Manasseh, I read a tremendous illustration of an evangelist in the life of the conversion of Manasseh. I may be inspired to preach on the conversion now of Manasseh. There was an evangelist laboring in the slums and he was so discouraged because they were given to alcohol and failure and tragedy 
and the loss of life and everything that goes with sin. And he could see very little fruit for his labor. And he wondered, could God ever save these people? Could God ever change their lives? Going to the house of God to preach, he had no heart to preach at all. He just felt he was a failure and nothing was ever going to happen. And he looked up to the Lord and as he looked up, he saw these beautiful white clouds, beautiful white clouds. And it's as though the Lord inspired him to think, now how were they formed? How were those clouds formed? Beautiful, white, there's not a white like them. How were they formed? And he looked down at his feet and he saw nothing but rubbish and slime and grease and puddles of water. He got the inspiration for preaching. And he said, out of the filthy puddles of these slums, God has created and made those white clouds. The evaporation of the water formed those very clouds, pure and white, and placed them in the heavens. And he realized if my God can make white clouds out of filthy puddles, then he can change the lives of these people. And he can make their lives clean and pure from the filth and dirt of these slums. And he can raise them to heavenly places in Christ Jesus because he's the God who makes white clouds out of filthy puddles. And no matter what your life has been and your sin has been, and I'm saying to you tonight, on the authority of the word of God, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, will cleanse you from all sin. And he'll give you peace and he'll save your soul tonight if you'll only come to him. Now, will you do it? Will you take that step of faith tonight? Will you say, it's Christ for me? I know I'm a sinner. I know Christ died for me. I'm coming, Lord, to thee. I'm coming. I'm trusting you. I'm asking you to be my saviour tonight. I'm believing on you. I'm receiving you by faith into my heart. I'm telling you I'm sorry for my sins and I believe you died for them and you rose from the dead and now I invite you. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today. Come in to stay. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Will you do that? Maybe you have done that and you've never told anybody yet. Well, confessions is made with the mouth onto. That's the assurance of salvation. You need to tell it out. We not broadcast it from the pulpit. We'll not get you in next week and leave Richard to another time and get you in to testify. Not at all. You need to tell someone. You need to share what the Lord has done for you with someone else. And I trust that the Lord will save you. And if you're not saved and you'd like to speak to our brother James or you'd like to speak to some elder or friend in the congregation that you know and can trust, or if you would like to speak to me, and we'll be around, we, we'll take time tonight. We really mean that. Uh, we're not in a hurry away and we'll open up the Bible, the word of God, and we will show you, we can't save you, but we'll show you from the Bible how you can be saved and be sure of heaven. And the Lord can save tonight. Thank you, James, for sharing with us that personal word of testimony. It's not easy to stand in this pulpit and it's not easy to revisit some of those things that are very hurtful and emotional in our lives. But the Lord is good. And we thank the Lord for saving our brother James. He's a dear friend of mine. And uh, I know uh, that he is a dear friend of this congregation. And we trust the Lord will bless you, James, and encourage your heart. I didn't know he was into ornithology when he went over to Scotland. And for the younger ones, birds, <laughs> had a wee chuckle at that one. Uh, but uh, the Lord has been good to him and watched over him and kept him safe. And those three goals that he scored were in the wrong net, by the way. He didn't tell you that one. All right. Well, we'll have prayer. Father in heaven, we thank thee for tonight. It's a joy to be in thy house and to listen to those who can look back to a time in their experience, whether it was in their younger days, as six, as our brother said, whether they came to Christ in a Sunday school class or in their bedroom or in a prison house or elsewhere. We thank thee, O oh God, for that day and the experience of many in this house when they were saved by sovereign grace and Lord, it's good to be saved in these days of uncertainty, in these days of COVID-19 and the variants that are coming throughout the earth, in these days when perilous times will come and what we're facing now by 
viruses is but the tip of the iceberg. Realize that in Adam and his fall in the garden, it has brought sin and misery into this world, and there's more to come. And the full harvest of sin has yet to be reaped by mankind. And yet, Lord, we thank thee that there's hope in Christ. There's deliverance and joy. There's cleansing and healing through the blood. There's forgiveness of sins. There's peace with God. There's rightness with the Lord. There's a home in heaven, eternal life, all wrapped up in the bundle of joy and life in Christ. And oh, that sinners might come and take the free offer and gift of salvation and receive into their heart and life personally Christ as their own and personal Savior. Lord, we recognize that we cannot save them. We pray by thy spirit that would convict and convert and bring young people, boys and girls and older people to Christ. Cause, O oh God, in this house there to be joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repents of their sin. Part is now in thy fear and with thy favor. Take us to our homes in safety and grant those of us who are saved we leave this house prayerfully and carefully that we might share Christ with those in need as our brother James did with that young fellow Aaron. We pray, Lord, we might seek out individuals who are backslidden or not saved. Uh, should we have to write a letter to them, send a text message or an email or a WhatsApp or meet up for them for coffee, go around and call at their door, and speak to their soul and get a burden for lost souls and for backslidden souls and to reach out to our fellow man. Lord, we want to love them in Christ's name. We don't wish them any ill. Lord, we don't in any way envy them in their sin. We pity them. We have compassion and love, but it's the love of God. It's the love of Christ. It's the love of the Spirit that constrains us to reach out with the gospel. Oft times that we're misunderstood as if, Lord, there's some brownie points for us, there's not. We desire only their highest good, that they might share what we have. They might come to know Christ as we do. They might have their sins forgiven. They might have eternal life and never perish. They'll never be dropped into hell. They'll never be, O oh God, lost in that place where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And it burns as we speak and reaches out for souls even now. And if we could only see it, there are millions of souls who are dropping into hell every second of this meeting. Lord, from the beginning right till now at the end, millions of souls have been perishing in hell faster than the church can reach them. And we are sitting about, Lord, at times doing nothing. Forgive us, Lord. What a crime against humanity. We cry, O oh God, as believers who have the truth, that we will share it. And no matter what discomfort we meet with, what opposition we have to face, no matter what people think of us, help us to lose our fear of man and help us to fear God and to fear him who not only can kill the body but can kill the soul in hell. I say unto you, Jesus said, fear ye him. So hear our prayer. Save the lost in this house. Take of our thanks for thy servant. Bless James. Remember his mum and dad. We pray for Sam and for Lydia and the whole family circle. We commend them, Janine, and the whole family to thee and ask for thy gracious hand upon them. And we pray, Lord, you'll encourage them and you'll strengthen them. You'll bless them richly and use them for thine eternal glory. We offer this our prayer this evening in our Saviour's precious and most worthy name. And the people of God said, Amen.